been done before. I urge you to consider the, um, the Patriot Act. So the Patriot Act is one of the worst acts and I think it should be repealed instantly. However, I know that I can't do that, so I'm just going to complain about it instead. <laughs> so there's a very harmful basis for the Act's inception, and this was following the 9-11 text on um, the Pentagon and the Twin Towers. And so you can imagine, like, that was kind of the first of its kind attack on American soil. People were very upset for very good reason, particularly Congress. Congress was really worried about the implications. They were worried what's going to happen next. Was there going to be another attack? How do we do this? How do we prevent it in the future? So on and so forth. Again, all incredibly valid points. However, that law was turned around extremely quickly. Basically, overnight, the House and the Senate passed the law, and that allows for surveillance of literally everyone who could be a terrorist at any point in time. And guess what? They don't have to tell you. They can infringe on your Fourth Amendment rights. <laughs> they do not have to tell you. They do not have to give you notice of what they're going to look into. They do not have to talk to you about the wiretaps that they're going to be conducting. And that has had very dangerous implications for people, especially black and brown people, especially Muslims in this country, especially people who are not seen as American enough, especially immigrants. And what does that say about the spirit of the law? The spirit of the law was we're going to have security in the country. The letter of the law says, eh, but you don't have to worry about actual constitutional rights. The letter of the law in this case is basically saying that this is all okay, but the spirit of the law was for national security. It was to provide Congress, provide the executive branch, provide all branches of government with a method of analyzing events, of looking into people who could be considered dangerous to the country, and regardless of what the implications were, it did come from somewhat of a solid place, right? because that's what laws are. But again, this brings me back to my point that laws are political. It does not negate the fact that Islamophobia was a huge factor in why this was passed overnight. It does not negate the fact that implementation was firmly based on Islamophobic sentiments, on anti-immigrant sentiments, and so on and so forth. So if you were to consider the letter of the law here, what would that say? That would say, that's okay. Continue to wiretap people. Continue to surveil them. You don't have to tell them anything. And that has happened time and time again in American history. And so I urge you today to consider the fact that if we can, if we only follow the letter of the law, and if that takes the utmost priority over everything else, because that is what the affirmation is arguing. And to this extent, I am not convinced that the letter of the law can be the thing we think about first at every time, every single time. Every single time. This is not something that we can, you know, the letter of the law saying that that must take precedence does not allow for the flexibility that the law provides and the law should provide. And so going on to my next point, um, I'm going to do what I do best, which is make it about me. Uh, so because I'm very cool and popular, uh, I'm still on Facebook. Uh, which is great because I can see which friends from home are engaged, uh, you know get invited to Tombs Night, and most importantly, be a proud member of the Third Amendment Facebook group. <laughs> yeah, Third Amendment stands rise up. <laughs> Which, in fact, is a shockingly large group, and I encourage you all to join it, because it's fabulous. So, for those of you who don't know, the Third Amendment is my favorite amendment. Um, despite being a political hack, I do think that that is the most neutral of laws. Um, and, you know, for those of you who don't remember it, the text off the top of your head like I do, um, the text reads, no sh soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a matter prescribed by law. So basically, soldiers can't hang in your house unless you say so. Cool. So this amendment is one of the most uncontroversial amendments in American history, uh, because there's nothing really to fight about. People like their privacy, people like being in their own home without, like, you know, the army there. <laughs> Which, hey, fair. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever. Um, fun fact, my friends, boyfriend showed up to our house once and he goes to the Naval Academy, so he's wearing Naval Academy gear. I was like, ha ha, you can't come in. <laughs> <Third Amendment. laughs> so I had that in my back pocket. Um, so yeah, it's a, it, people say that it doesn't hold relevance to the modern day because it's not something we think about all the time. It's not something we use all the time. Criminal justice writer Bradley Balfour actually once called it the runt piglet of the U.S. Constitution, <laughs> which is just such an aggressive term for something that objectively, like, who cares? <laughs> you know? Um, and the Supreme Court has actually never heard a case on the Third Amendment. Only one case on the Third Amendment has ever reached the U.S. Court of Appeals, and that was in 1982. That is very recent, guys. <laughs> we went all this time. Um, so for context, this amendment dates back to 
the colonial period. So when uh, the British were, you know, in the process of colonizing North America, among many, many other places, they decided that any time there was going to be a war on North American soil, they were going to have soldiers quartered in people's houses. So that put the burden on the colonists to house these soldiers. They didn't want to house the soldiers, which is kind of, you know, fair to them because they were trying to rebel against the soldiers. Kind of hard to do that when, like, your boss is looking over you. Um, and so. Because of this burden, there was a really strong sentiment within America, particularly within, you know, kind of the idea of a new republic, the context of building a democracy, that people should not be forced to have someone in their home against their will. And there was a very vivid memory of what that meant to people. There was a very vivid memory of the fact that there was a militarization of sorts on the streets. Your house became a militarized entity. Your house became a place that you were not safe, or you were safe per the law. And so this brings me back to the landmark case by the U.S. Court of Appeals in the Second Circuit of 1982, uh, Englund v. Carey. And so this was following the Attica prison riots. Um, and if you guys do not know what it is, I'm running out of time. I urge you to look it up later. Um, and it was basically this awful uprising, um, uprising, which is what it's called. But it's basically where you know prisoners were trying to advocate for themselves to have better rights. The government said, "No, you are not people." Whole thing terrible. So during this time, a lot of prison officers went on strike because they didn't want to give prisoners more rights. They didn't want to have incarcerated people dehumanized in any way. And so because they were on strike, the government was like, well, we're going to call the National Guard in to deal with this because you're not dealing with it. Um, also, you're evicted from your home so we can put the National Guard in. And so there was a really strong question of whether the National Guard counted as a soldier who could be quartered in your house during wartime or peace. And it, it feels very ridiculous to say that like this came up and this was the framing, but at the end of the day, there was a serious question about what the spirit of the law meant. At that time, the founders did not know what the American legal system could be. They didn't, they didn't foresee kind of the changes that our society would go through. They didn't know uh, there was gonna be a National Guard. I mean, everybody forgets the National Guard. Um, but, but, they just simply didn't know, and that's okay. But taking the spirit of the law and taking into account that that amendment came out of the need to stop militarization in the American streets, to stop soldiers and people who are kind of this tool of the government to enforce the law, they do not have to be in your house, they do not have to do things in your own private space, that was the spirit. And so therefore, that could be applied here when people were literally being evicted. Despite how awful these correctional officers were, it was within their right to not only stay in their home, but also not have their house taken over by an actor of the government who is coming in to basically serve as a militarized force. And so taking that, and I don't want this to be a drop in the bucket debate, but I'm using these examples to really illustrate how deep this runs and how every single bit in the Constitution, in every legal system, in every method of enforcement, in everybody walking down the street, the law is you, you are an actor of the law, you are an individual. This all comes with spirit. To only follow the letter of the law negates the history of how laws were created, the context in which they are applied, all of that. And so I cannot in good conscience stand on the affirmation today because I don't negate that history. And you shouldn't either because it is incredibly important to the way our society functions, to the democracy that we live in, and the way that we are to move forward. So I end with the quote before we move to the discussion on the floor today. I hope that I've sufficiently convinced you, uh, if not now, maybe later. Uh, but this is a quote by James Baldwin. If one really wishes to know how justice is administered in a country, one does not question the policemen, the lawyers, the judges, or the protected members of the middle class. One goes to the unprotected, those precisely who need the law's protection the most, and listens to their testimony. And so today, when you're considering this on the floor, consider the testimony of people you've heard, consider the news you've read, consider the oppression that you've seen, consider the disrespect of human life, and think about how justice is not blind. And if we want to move towards a more equitable system, considering the spirit of the law and understanding that we are all human, we make mistakes, we have different judgments, we are diverse, we are people, that's what's going to make the law as best as it can be. Not following the strict wording that was created years and years and years ago with a very different concept, with people with very different spirits, and regardless of how you fall, in terms of whether the Constitution should be read as an, in an originalist way, or if you see the Constitution as more as a living document, I think we can all agree that context matters. And that's what this debate is about today. It's about history, it's about context, and it's about justice. Thank you. Thank you.